Australia has also moved to put pressure on Libya's government by imposing what it calls autonomous sanctions. For more, let's join Australia's Foreign Minister, Kevin Rudd. He's in Cairo and joins us live. Mr Rudd, thank you for being with us. Can I ask you first, just to let us know, what is your understanding of the current situation in Libya? I mean, we've had Saif al-Islam coming out and saying, we want the world's press to come and see that uh, what you've been saying is not true and everything is fine here in Libya and it's all a big misunderstanding. Was he right in that? I mean, what information do you have from on the ground about what is going on there? Uh, well, the statements just referred to, I think you said by their information minister, are simply incorrect. They are not factual. Uh, Libya is in the middle of a civil war, and that civil war has now reached the streets of Tripoli. Uh, it seems to us increasingly that the days of this regime are numbered. You've seen not only the defection of a range of Libyan diplomats from around the world, the resignation of a number of ministers from the Libyan government, but plainly the security situation on the ground is working against the Gaddafi regime. Its days, I believe, are numbered. If it is, as you say, a civil war, then is the UN Security Council resolution and your own autonomous sanction package announced recently going to be enough? The key thing is to see the unity of international opinion on this matter so that those within Libya know that the world is as one. There is one critical element of the UN Security Council resolution which we in Australia have strongly argued for for the last week and that is a reference to the International Criminal Court. This is critical for the regime in Tripoli to understand. That is, if they take further actions of violence, mass violence against innocent civilians in Libya, it is not just those who issue the orders, but also those who pull the trigger, who will then become subject to the jurisdiction of the criminal court. And it may take some time, but the criminal court will come after them and eventually get them and bring them to justice, as we are doing with other crimes against humanity around the world. Well, the issue here is, as you say, it may take some time, and in the time that it does take, if it ever does actually occur that we get Gaddafi to the International Criminal Court, any number of atrocities may yet be perpetrated, and that civil war, as you have described it, may well prove to be a bloody and very horrendous one. So why is this sanctions package, which really amounts to nothing more than uh, international condemnation, as you say, it's more rhetoric than fact. Why didn't it include uh, an air ban on a no-fly zone in the area, some sort of concrete action that might try and save lives? Well, let me go to the two parts of your question. The first is the actual teeth of this UN Security Council resolution are quite sharp. Firstly, in terms of the targeted sanctions against members of the regime, this is very important. The Gaddafi family has significant financial assets invested around the world, including in the United Kingdom and elsewhere. This therefore affects directly personal financial interests. Secondly, an arms embargo is necessary in order to prevent the further resupply of military equipment to those military units remaining supportive of Gaddafi. And thirdly, the criminal court reference is important. It's only the second time in the history of the UN this has been done. It's not so much that Gaddafi himself may take notice of this, but those underneath him must realise that in executing any command to take violent action against civilians, these people who have pulled triggers will be brought to justice All right, well, as well. Let me stop you there if I could for a moment, and just forgive me for interrupting, but the point remains that the fact uh, is that Gaddafi has for 40 years now more or less snubbed his nose at the international community anyway. These threats, these sanctions will mean nothing to him, particularly since he's already vowed to die a martyr in Libya should the need arise. So my question remains, in between the time that these um, sanctions that you say are not toothless, they're very sharp toothed, when they actually have an effect on the country in some sense, in between that time and now, there could still be enormous bloodshed. What is the international community going to do if he uses the arms he already has against his own people and starts causing some serious bloodshed? Well, the first thing I'd say also is that you said that Gaddafi himself may be contemptuous of these measures. Those underneath him who take his commands may actually be attentive to these measures because that is the whole purpose of the International Criminal Court. However, I also believe that further action needs to be taken by the Council. You mentioned before the desirability of no-fly zones over Libya. We in Australia fully support that course of action. In my own correspondence with the pre President of the Security Council, 
Uh, I have said that Australia fully supports the imposition of no-fly zones within, um, within Libya itself. As for other actions by the Council, my own view as Australia, as the Australian Foreign Minister, is that all other options should remain on the table as well. Talk. This is a serious situation. There is mass loss of life and therefore with the international community cannot remain silent and must have all other options on the table. Uh, the fact is the international community has remained silent for a number of years now, ever since uh, Gaddafi began this so-called rehabilitation in the international community. To what extent do you think Australia is responsible for allowing this to occur in the first place by allowing Gaddafi to become uh, a more respected figure in the international community? Uh, you, in fact, were Prime Minister when Amnesty International published their last report last year in which they were saying the human rights situation in Libya is still dire and calling on people to take more action. And yet, no Nobody did. Well, in terms of international forums, our long-standing view, view has been that human rights obligations are universal and not particular to any country or any group of people at any time. So why didn't you take Therefore, the abuses then? which have... our position on human rights has been constant. The position that I have taken, uh, if reflected in statements of mine from uh, the end of last year has spoken very loudly and clearly about global democratic deficits, and that includes, of course, in countries like Libya. Can I further go on to another point? And that is, the reason the international community in the last decade, led by the United States, led by the Europeans and others, uh, in relation to Gaddafi, was to engineer an arrangement whereby he stepped away from a program of further uh, development of weapons of mass destruction. That was the nature of the undertaking then, and those were the reasons why international governments around the world began to adopt a different approach to Libya. That did not mean, however, that human rights abuses stopped there and then. They did not. They have continued. You talked about uh, the freezing of his assets, and you say that may well be a, a fairly effective sanction. Um, the Sydney Morning Herald this morning has an article saying that they suspect that uh, Gaddafi and his sons have uh, millions of dollars worth of investments in Australia. What can you tell us about that, and uh, how hard are you going to go after them? Uh, the first is that it is only following the imposition of autonomous sanctions that we in Australia then had the legal footing to investigate the holding of assets within Australia as well. On the core of your question, we will deploy every single resource to track down what assets Gaddafi, and we've listed 24 other key members of family in the regime, may have within Australia. Uh, we will undertake our obligations on that, as I'm sure the British will as well, and others where we either suspect or know that Gaddafi has assets. This is one element of the international response, the objective of which is to cause Gaddafi to go. Let's assume for a minute that he does decide that going is in his best interest. So you mentioned a moment ago uh, when he gave up his nuclear weapons that you thought it was a, a good way of encouraging uh, further progress in this. Would that same approach work if he now turned around and said, OK, I will step down under certain conditions? And by this, I mean specifically if he said, I want international protection, to what, what would Australia's reaction to be, be in that situation? Would you be willing to facilitate his departure and, and give him some kind of safety guarantees? Our attitude to that is that the actions undertaken by him already, subject to what has now been agreed to by the UN Security Council, must now be investigated uh, by uh, the International Criminal Court with a view to prosecution. That is uh, what has now been agreed as a course of action. In terms of him leaving, that of course is a matter for him. Our objective uh, is to ensure that this series of actions results in a minimum loss of further life in, in Libya, in addition to what has occurred already. In terms of possible sources of uh, sanctuary for Gaddafi and his family, I'll leave that matter to others who have had a much closer relationship with this regime than we have ever had. Kevin Rudd in Cairo, thank you very much indeed for talking to us.